Hi, in this video, we're going to take a look at multi-area OSPF and the OSPF link state advertisements. So as you might remember from previous video, we have five basic OSPF v2 packet types. OSPF v3, they're slightly different, but more or less the same. Uh, but if we look at for the link state update LSUs, we actually have five LSA types. There are a few more, but these are the five main ones, the ones that we're going to be looking at. Okay, so the first one we want to look at is LSA1. These are router link states. So in a previous video, when I talked about uh, link state operations and how <laughs> the link state algorithm actually builds a map, the topology. Uh, we're actually talking about router link states, LSAs. These are the uh, link state advertisements that contain information about the router's links. So this might include the uh, interfaces, different interfaces, the IP prefix, prefix length on the interface, the type of network, the cost of the link, any uh, neighbor routers on that link. <clears throat> These are the link states that are actually shared within a single area that routers use to build the topology. So if you remember that they run the SPF algorithm, build the SPF tree, using all these link states flooded within that area, and then they offer the best path to the routing table. Okay, <clears throat> so each router floods their router link states, LSA1s, only within that area. So area one routers, including the ABR, on uh, router R1 in this case, that has an interface or interfaces in this area, will also be have a link state database for this area. They'll all flood their information just for the links in this area. <clears throat> area zero routers will do the same thing, including the AVRs, and Area 51 routers will do the same thing for all their links. And again, it's just for the links in that area. The LSA ones announce the networks, the links within that area. Whenever a new LSA is received and installed in the LSDB, the link state database, the routers will forward that in this hop by hop or asynchronous flooding technique to all the routers within the area. This is used again to build the topology map of that area. And as I just said earlier, they use the information, the LSA1 information in their link state database, run the SPF algorithm, uh, build the SPF tree and offer the best path to the routing table. And the ABR will include a separate set of LSA1s for each area they belong to. All right, so we actually have seen this in the routing table, okay? These are denoted by just an O in OSPF E2 or a C for directly connected routes, but these are all the, the networks within that area, okay? So the remote networks, the learn via OSPF in that area will have just an O by them. All right. <clears throat> LSA2s, network link states. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these. Network LSAs are generated by every designated router for every multi-access network. And we'll be talking more about designated routers and backup designated routers in a later video. They are flooded only within that area. And uh, all the routers in that area will include the LSA2s within their link state databases. Uh, I won't go into any more detail than that for in this video, uh, but for the for all we've included them just for really continuity. Make sure we include all the LSA to all the LSAs. All right, but they don't play a major role as far as what I what we need to talk about in this video. But LSA threes do. These are summary LSAs. These are LSAs originated by the area border router. So uh, LSA, so if you notice here, we have uh, in area one here, we have LSA ones that are flooded within area one. 
the ABR is going to take these LSA ones, and as we're going to see here, they are going. The ABR will then convert them to LSA threes, summary LSAs, into area zero. These LSA threes will be propagated throughout area zero, and in this case, to another ABR, area 51 ABR, and again, get propagated into area 51 also as LSA threes. And we're gonna see the significance of this in just a moment. Okay, but the LSA threes describe the links between the ABR and internal routers of the local area. Basically, they're LSA one information. Okay, but as we're gonna see, they don't generate, they don't cause these routers to recalculate the SPF algorithm. But they are link state information, network information about networks, routes in other areas. So LSA1s learned in one area are sent as LSA3s into the other areas. They're sent as a type of distance vector type of route. And again, do not require the SPF algorithm to be rerun. An ABR will include LSAs, a uh, set of LSAs for each area it belongs to. So it, uh, for example, this ABR here, will include a set of LSA threes for area one, okay? And it would also include a set of LSA threes in area one for the LSA ones that it knows about in area zero. Okay, let's see the significance of this more in a moment. <clears throat> but LSA threes are flooded through, throughout the backbone area zero and to other area border routers. All right, let's take a look at this in another way. So we have two area border routers here, okay? There's a change in the topology in area one. So whichever router is connected to that change or routers will generate the LSA one. And that LSA ones get flooded throughout that area, okay? Now remember that LSA ones, they get installed in the link state database. They cause the SPF algorithm to rerun. The SPF, then from the SPF algorithm, uh, calculates a SPF tree, best paths to all the, uh, all the routes. And then the best, these best paths are offered to the routing table. Yep. Again, that's, that's what we, we talked about in the uh, video about link state operations and I read that's if you look at Dijkstra's algorithm that's what they're talking about there. Okay the ABR though okay it it will have just like the other routers in area one a map of the topology for area one but as far as its connection to area zero it will actually convert this LSA one into an LSA three. Now these routers in area zero, including the ABR, and it's, remember it has link state database for area one and area zero. In this case, the LSA three gets added to the link state database, and then it just updates the routing table or with an offer to the routing table to be updated. There's no SPF algorithm, no SPF tree. Same thing here. Uh, the ABR connecting area 51 also propagates this LSA3 throughout area 51. And all of these routers, including the ABR and its links into area 51, update their link state database and basically just update their routing table. No SPF algorithm needs to be run. So you can see <coughs> the advantage of using multiple areas. Only those routers in that area need to actually rerun the SPF tree, or rerun the SPF algorithm, excuse me, and come up with an SPF tree and uh, update their routing table accordingly. Uh, because those are the only routers, in this case, the routers in area one that actually have a map of the topology. Uh, for area one, area zero routers and area 51 routers, uh, not including the ABR uh, between area one and area zero, but area zero and area 51 routers 
will not have a map of area one's topology. They only have maps of their own area. Okay, all right. So we can actually see uh, the inter-area networks in the routing table. Okay, there an O followed by IA, OSPF inter-area routes for, that's how it's designated for OSPF version two. All right, LSA fours. These are autonomous system boundary router summary link states. Okay, let's talk a little bit about these. These are actually originated by the area border router. And basically they're flooded throughout the area and it just describes reachability to the ASBR. It's basically telling routers in that area, hey, I know how to get to the ASBR. Okay, and remember our ASBR is right here. Okay. So it's just telling routers in their area, hey, I'm your way to uh, get to the ASBR. I'm gonna talk more about that in just a moment. Okay. Now, these LSA4s are not advertised if the area is a stub or totally stubby network. Okay, and this is why we want the ASBR to be in the backbone area. Okay, and, we, and I'm gonna come back to stub and totally stubby in just a moment. All right, let's continue, take a look at, okay, so LSA4s answer the question, how do area border routers and other routers know about the ASBR? Well, we just said so, right? We just mentioned it. Okay, there's our ASBR, okay? the area border routers will flood the LSA4s into their perspective areas. The, now, how does the ABR know to do this? Okay, well, the ASBR sends a type one LSA, a router LSA type one, with the external bit, EBIT set to identify itself as the ASBR. What? Okay. Well, why does the ASBR send out LSA1s? Those are those router link states that describe its own links um, and that routers in that area use to, uh, well, they add it to their link state database, run the SPF uh, algorithm, come up with an SPF tree and all that, and then offer the path to the, to the routing table. Why does the ASBR do that? How does it become an ASBR? Okay, let's take a look. Okay, that takes us into the LSA-5s. An LSA-5 is an external LSA. This is origin originated by the ASBR, Autonomous System Boundary Router. Basically, it describes any networks external to this OSPF routing domain. These LSA-5s, this is about external networks, external to a routing domain, okay? So anything out here, okay? That's what the LSA-5 is gonna describe. Hey, these are external networks. They're not part of our OSPF routing domain. Yep, so they're flooded throughout the OSPF routing domain, except stub and totally stubby areas. So all routers will see them. Okay, that means all, this is how routers learn about external networks. Yep. They're denoted in the routing table as external type one or external type two. We'll, we'll talk more about those. The ASBR becomes an ASBR when LSA1s are sent with the external bit set. Okay, well, how, why does it do this? How does it know to do this? Okay, so if the ASBR if a router is configured with one of these two commands, a redistribute command, okay, this actually says I'm going to read it in this case static routes, but basically says I'm going to redistribute information in my routing table into OSPF. That's one way that a router becomes the ASBR. Another way that it becomes an ASBR is if it uses a command called default information originate, okay? This is how OSPF advertises a default route. If you learned a little bit about RIP, RIP does the same, uses the same command. 
default information originate that if you have say a static default route, this command here, default information originate will advertise that route throughout the OSPF domain. Well, it's these two commands that, that tell this router, hey, I'm an ASBR, autonomous system boundary router. So when I send out my LSA ones, I'm gonna let everybody know who gets those LSA ones, which is basically the area border routers know, that I'm the ASBR, okay? That's when I send out my LSA ones with the external EBIT set, they, they will know, the ABRs will know that I'm the ASBR, Autonomous System Boundary Router. Well, when these routers see that, these two ABRs see that, says, oh, we now have heard from the ASBR, and they'll set, send out an LSA4 to tell their routers, hey, we know where the ASB, uh, ASBR is. Okay, maybe a little bit more than you really needed to know, but I think it's always good to kind of help clarify how this stuff works. It's not magic, it's not hard. It's just, you know, the protocols, the rules, right? Okay. Okay, so LSA5, so when, do, here's we have router R1, and in this case, uh, route the ASBR, here we got right here, our autonomous system boundary router, okay, has a static route to some 57 network, has a default route. So we've redistributed the static route, says redistribute this static route into my OSPF domain and advertise my default route into the OSPF domain. That's what these two commands do, associated with these two static routes. Okay, so as you can see here, we have uh, router R1 sees both of these routes and they say E2, external type two. So, well, obviously it's external, what's that type two? Okay, we're not gonna get into a lot of detail on this right now, uh, later video, talk much more about this in my CCNP classes, but a type two route is always the external cost, irrespective of the internal cost to reach that route. So the, uh, the metric, the cost will be 20 for all redistributed routes, okay? So all of these routes that were used to redistribute command will have a metric of 20, okay? I'm gonna come back to this here in a moment. And as far as our default route, default originate command goes, uh, uh, default information originate, this is gonna have the cost of this outgoing interface here, which has a cost of one. Now the interesting thing is, this cost 20 and one for these two routes will be the same cost that this router will see, this router will see, this router, this router, this router. And if I had routers way out here, way out here in area one, they would all show the same cost, okay? No matter, and no matter what their path was to get there, okay? I'll talk about that in a later video, but the, uh, let me just mention, in case you're wondering, well, what if we had a router out here connected to multiple routers and it has the same cost, which, which way will it go, okay? Uh, they're using other LSAs, like LSA4s and LSA3s, uh, these routers determine what the best path is. So the best path is still utilized, irrespective of what this says. Okay, all right. More detail than I needed to go into right now for you. Okay, here's my couple of notes. There's an external type one that you can actually modify uh, how these get redistributed instead of type two, type one, that actually does increment, accumulate the cost uh, using bandwidth uh, of the route. So you'd actually see the cost change increment increase the further away you are from the ASBR. And as I mentioned, although a router may have multiple paths to an E2 route, where the metric is always the same, OSPF routers will still determine the best path 
to the ASBR using L other LSAs. Again, that's beyond the scope of this presentation, uh, but I'll do another video on that sometime. Let's go back to our stub and totally stubby areas. First of all, let me talk about the normal areas because we're going to come back and talk about these, these uh, uh, LSAs here. Uh, so normally what we would see is, let's take router R3. What it would see is all the networks in its area, right? And it would have a map, right? It has a map of this area here, okay? Because these are all LSA ones. Okay, it will learn via LSA threes, okay, about all of these. Okay, that's how it learns about all of these networks, LSA threes. All right, oh, another one there. Okay, so it learns about those using LSA threes. And external networks, these out here, I'll make a box, okay. It will learn about those using LSA fours. Okay, so the router thirty-three R thirty-three will see all the networks in its own area, in other areas, inter area, and external. Okay, but we want to limit the size of link state databases. We want to reduce the size of routing tables. So we can do. Th we talked about stub and totally stubby areas. So let's take a look at what that looks like as far as LSAs go. Okay, so this is beyond the scope of CCNA, but you might find this interesting. Stub area. Okay, so remember stub area gets a default route from the ABR. And it, so what a stub area sees is uh, it's going to see a default route routes in its own area, because those are those LSA ones, right? And it's also going to see LS routes in other areas. It's still going to get those LSA threes, okay? All right, so what does it get as far as LSA? So it gets LSA threes, no LSA fours, and no LSA fives. Why is that? Because these are associated with out here, the external networks, okay? It doesn't need, it's not gonna get, learn anything about external networks. So it's not gonna get any LSA fives. They're blocked by the ABR. Well, if it doesn't need to know about any external networks, it doesn't need to know about where the a ASBR is, right here. It doesn't need to know about that because it's not gonna get any external networks. All it needs to know from the ABR is for it to advertise those LSA threes about networks in other areas. Okay, so how about totally stubby area? Remember, totally stubby area gets the default route from the ABR and nothing else. So what do you think it's blocked here? It's not gonna see these, these routers in area one in a totally stubby area are not gonna see networks, link states in other areas. So what do you think gets blocked? It's only gonna see networks in its own area. LSA threes get blocked. We don't need to know about anything in other areas. I got a default route. LSA fours and LSA fives get blocked. Same reason as stub areas. We don't need to know, we don't need to know LSA fives. We're not learning about external networks. I have a default route. And if I not, don't need to know about default networks, I don't need to know where the ASBR is. All right, I hope this kind of helped a little bit, a little bit beyond CCNA. All right, so that's multi-area OSPF and OSPF LSAs.